Good morning. So I'm going to discuss how we recognise cultural diversity in a hypothetical global code of conduct. There will be provocation in this. I have no particular answers. Do people who are on the IPSIG committee and the members of IPSIG don't have any particular answers? But right now we're trying to thresh out those questions so we can actually start to, to look at conflicts, look at agreements, look at any kind of areas of consensus and common ground um, to move forwards or to abandon ship. All possibilities are out there. So I'll start with some background. Our sense of right and wrong goes back a long way. There's a vast theoretical literature regarding general ethics as old as philosophy itself. These codes are based on concepts of natural law or supreme ethical principles recorded in written sources in Babylon, Israel, Greece, China, such as here the, the law code of Hammurabi about 1750 BCE, which confidently asserts the king's intention to bring about the rule of righteousness in the land, destroying the evildoers so that the strong shall not harm the weak, so that they should enlighten the land to further the well-being of mankind. However, so that's lovely, isn't that nice? However, subjects weren't equal and the code dismissed the humanity of half the planet, women. Sources looking at this sort of universal ethics include the, the hymns of the Rig Veda in India, that we've seen earlier, Greek philosophers, Lao Tse in China. People all over the world have been grappling with these issues and some of them have been writing down their, their views on the matter. These reflect well-connected trading partners trying to solve problems, including how to formulate principles of ethics that have genuinely universal appeal. These have further been developed in mythological and ideological traditions, such as Buddhism and various Christian traditions. There are a vast range of cultures and indigenous peoples around the world with their own concepts and practices of ethics. These reflect the structure of kin-based societies and share concepts of reciprocity, of interdependence and interconnectedness, living and working together for the common good, fulfilling inherited duties, duties towards the poor and the weak, maintaining good relationships with people, with other life forms, with the land and the environment. There's a long tradition of African moral thought where traditional thinking expresses social ethics and duties through many maxims and proverbs and stories. And some communities also have very complex traditional situations, uh, systems for arbitration and dispute resolution. So in both written and indigenous versions of ethics, views on socially moral behaviours have changed over time. Practices including caste systems, slavery and violence, the succession of elites, adherence to authority, and specific practices such as killing twins, child brides, genital mutilation, cannibalism. These have been redefined as external influences and sometimes internal influences have affected these social moral standards. One common theme across all of these movements, however, is the golden rule, the principle of reciprocity. It's been common to all major religions and philosophies throughout human history, but unfortunately there's a lot it doesn't say. It defines how we should treat people in relation to our own feelings and how we should be treated. It doesn't help when we need to make really complex ethical decisions based on limited information and uncertain outcomes. Perhaps a variation on the golden rule might be considered. There's, there's, there are mentions of a platinum rule calling for a more thoughtful approach, asking that you treat others as they would want to be treated. And turning this on its head, Gandhi once said, whatever you do for me, without me, you do against me. So these ideas have been studied extensively in the context of international business practice and corporate culture. It's thrilling, isn't it? From attitudes to complying with rules, to authority, to day-to-day -day workplace etiquette and tolerance for uncertainty. 
However, not all societies have or want to have the same values of neoliberal capitalism and liberal democracy. Cultural relativism suggests that Western norms should not be imposed. Context must be practice. The great majority of people have civil and political rights. Many face discriminatory employment practices. Some cultures value family connections and loyalty over personal liberty. Some places tolerate bribery. Actually, some places wouldn't function without it. Gift giving may sometimes be central to good manners and hospitality. Perks and nepotism aren't something terrible, but they express family or corporate loyalty. Foreign interests and values may not reflect local values relevant to the identities of local communities. For example, focusing on one part of history that interests us as archaeologists may be viewed as bafflingly irrelevant or utterly undermining to their worldviews. Foreign intervention can exacerbate existing problems in fragmented societies with mystic and religious groups. Um, and the consequences of targeting well-meaning heritage-linked assistance to conflict-affected communities are not yet fully understood. Really, the structure of archaeology in many places is still neo-colonial. It involves extracting knowledge and leaving very little benefit. There is a lot of peripheral lip service to education and training, conservation, to the role of heritage and development and peacemaking, and also to the fairly demeaning concept sometimes of capacity building and community support, as if people can't do things for themselves. Is there a risk here of kidding ourselves that there is one single set of absolute truths and precepts that call for exactly the same behaviour all over the world? Cultures have different standards of ethical behaviour and different ways of handling unethical behaviour from simply turning a blind eye to it all the way through to capital punishment. Some people hold there's essential and self-evident ethical principles and norms for human survival and happiness. Universal ethics could serve as, as guidance for behaviour across places and cultures, beliefs and all times. These are the core from which applied ethics such as professional ethics could be said to grow. The challenge really for us is to find a shared minimum core set of values, a moral consensus that we're all obliged to respect, which takes account of cultural diversity and differences, a religion of worldviews of time and place, which respects local traditions and considers the real world context and consequences of our actions. Local conditions matter when deciding what is right and what is wrong. Um, professional ethics are the one thing that would bind us as a collective group aiming to serve society and also as individual professionals. Really, why should an organisation like CIFA meddle in global ethics? Is it not grossly arrogant? Does it not violate the sovereignty of other people's cultures and countries, their own systems? I'll leave that one open to the floor to decide for yourselves and debate in due course, but I would say that non-governmental organisations and epistemic expert organisations can and do set standards and guidelines and norms. And these can drive standardization of quality and raise public expectations around the world. There are plenty of precedents from medicine to language interpreting and to thrilling areas like tax accountancy. So these norms do have some benefits of being supposedly independent and impartial. They do have the potential to influence the development and implementation and potentially enforcement of standards through regional, transnational and national lawmaking. CIFA does not have an exclusive claim on global ethics and standard setting, but it is devoting significant technical expertise to developing codes and standards and may be in the process of becoming a standards maker. Archaeologists around the world are free 
They're free to be a standard taker and adopt CIFA's code in its entirety, or to invent their own code, or to adapt any code to reflect their concerns and areas of common interest. There is no not at this point. Starting point for applied ethics might be that norms need to be consistent, objective, derived from reason and proportionate, formulated according to values that respect human dignity, that respect basic rights, equality and justice, and that further good citizenship, supporting education and livelihoods, working with host governments and other organisations to protect her and the wider environment. Any of these rules should be simple, minimal, easy to remember, and this would make implementation easier. Perhaps rather than seeing this very much as a black and white either or debate, some kind of a conciliatory hybrid approach would allow a universalist code that grants cultural diversity and permits variation from universal principles and considers the context in which we make ethical decisions. Any global conduct has to be explicit to be useful though. It also needs to leave room there for professional judgment in situations requiring cultural sensitivity. And some actions may be permissible even if they conflict with ethical attitudes in the UK. We've discussed this earlier. However, this gray area may make a common code hard to actually enforce. A lot of the current code of conduct deals with professional behavior to many, many professional disciplines. However, this utilitarian global code assumes that all people seek and desire the same thing, that my version of the good and my motivations are the same as all of yours. Even when accepting the content of moral rules, people don't always follow them. Historical conditioning, the psychological and social factors, all of these venal personal things that were mentioned earlier, they may result in disagreement among people on the content of moral rules and the extent to which they can actually be applied. And as was mentioned again earlier, it's always possible with a little bit of imagination to find exceptions to most rules. In an international archaeology and cultural heritage context, because this isn't just all about archaeology in the ground, it's also about cultural heritage, it's about intangible heritage, it's about the big picture holistic heritage and how it links to natural heritage. It's, this, is, this, is, this is archaeology for CIFA, but going way, way wider to look at culture and almost cultural workers. It's, there's a lot of conflict there with existing legally and culturally binding norms, with the politics of the day, with being seen as a Western or an Anglo-centric imposition. It may conflict with communitarian ideals, nationalism, with tribal ideologies and with theocratic regimes. Governments may seek to drive their own very specific heritage narrative, usually favourable to a particular ethnic group or a religious group or a caste and excluding others. The definitions of local and indigenous and descendant communities aren't easy and they're hotly debated. And who we choose to listen to and how we listen is a very, very complex issue. It's a complex issue that is addressed by various other codes of conduct already in existence by, from various ethnographic and anthropological organisations. There is no need here for CIFA to reinvent the wheel. A lot of this work has already been done a lot of very recent codes have recently been issued on these very issues. On the question of legitimacy there, there's a community groups, they might lay claim to the discourse assuming authority over their heritage and claiming the legitimacy of their own ways of understanding. So where do we fit in there as professionals, as people who, who like to see themselves, who flatter themselves as experts? On a personal level, a global code could well conflict with a colleague's perceived liberty to behave as they wish. In real situations, government employees may not be being paid to on time or at all. They may depend on contract work to survive. They may guard their knowledge and skills jealously as their livelihood and their status depends on this. A code might conflict with individual self-interest, threatening social, academic and administrative status, threatening people's aspirations for control and influence and power. 
their sources of income and also their ability to exploit or use or manipulate or exploit networks and people and their own agendas. Any code could run the risk of further furthering the interests of those established professional archaeologists who are relative to many of their compatriots, the educated, the privileged, and people who are already powerful. So what, what values could we all share in common with archaeologists all over the place? Professional behaviour and values may include, and this again is open to debate, um, soon, soon, uh, um, operating in a legal manner and respecting the law, exercising professional behaviour and good judgement, respecting and collaborating with and crediting colleagues, treating the next generation of archaeologists fairly, sticking to our areas of competence, training ourselves and only doing work that we're competent to do, being aware of those conflicts of interest. Being careful to understand where funding is coming from and where it's going and how equitably it's being redistributed among third party suppliers. Being accountable to the public, whoever they may be, to other archaeologists and to clients. Um, showing respect for local culture and customs. This needs proper consideration of living cultural heritage and contemporary populations. It needs in, engaging fairly with local or indigenous or vulnerable people, with elders, with traditional heritage stewards. It's also prudent to work closely with local archaeologists, with ethnographers and earth scientists and ecologists and socioeconomists who are local to that area and to behave in a sensitive manner that reflects local context. But it's also important to give due credit and respect to the inputs of foreign expertise. There's, there's, there's many, many sides to this, um, but it's not all about um, one interest group uh, prevailing over others. So in conclusion, colleagues around the world, many, many of them already work ethically without CFIS code of conduct. The concept of a simple global code of ethics to bind us all is seductive. However, Global convergence and consensus are not necessarily feasible or desirable. The norms developed by communities of experts can be a helpful guide to structuring reflection on these ethical issues. Perhaps rather than having one thing or another or rejecting things totally or embracing things totally, that hybrid approach could allow for a global code of conduct that grants cultural diversity, that permits variation from universal principles when considering the context in which ethical decisions are made. So to seek to end on a more positive note, it's broadly in everyone's interests to seek to embed good professional practice and influence the expectations of the public, of regulators, of the clients and also of each other. Thank you.